Welcome PCS members and friends uh, to our today's uh, PCS IBS seminar. Um, it is a great pleasure to have with us uh, Professor Johannes Richter and I would like to invite our scientific host Alexei to introduce our speaker. Please Alexei. Okay, yeah, thank you Tillen. So today's speaker is Professor Johannes Richter from uh... Magdeburg University or University of Magdeburg in, in Germany. He will be talking about quantum uh, frustrated quantum magnetism, the flat band scenario. So uh, Professor Richter received his PhD in 1977 from the Technical University of Dresden and then um, was holding a position at the scientist at the University for Communication in Dresden at the, and uh, at the Moscow State University in Russia and since uh, 1992 he's a professor um, he was a professor at the University of uh, Magdeburg and later a head of the Institute of Theoretical Physics at the same university and his research interests center around uh, quantum many body systems and in particular frustrated uh, spin systems and uh, correlated electronic systems so with this let's uh, welcome our speaker And uh, Johannes, the screen is all yours. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's my pleasure to have the opportunity to give a talk. Uh, I will split my talk in two parts. First is just the title which was announced, Frustrated Quantum Magnetism, the flat band scenario. That will contain a wide introduction and focus on some recent developments in this field which were done in our group. In the second part, I will speak about some, un about, uh, some unpublished results, namely how can we drive magnetic systems into a flat pent point by application of an electric field. And that is related to an enhanced magnetic electric effect and electrocaloric effect. And the collaboration Concerning the second part is with Vadim Ohanian, Jürgen Schnack, and Jörg Schulenburg. Uh, concerning the first part, there are many collaborators, Oleg Dershko, Andreas Honegger, Roderich Mösner. I cannot mention all of them. Uh, the flat band physics is still a very attractive field of research. I remember our interesting workshop at your institute in 2017. And meanwhile, a lot of new developments, developments appeared and I will speak about some of them. Okay, broad introduction, I promised. Uh, the starting point from my point of view concerning strongly correlated system was the seminal papers by Andreas Mielke and Hal Tosaki on Hubbard model. The question was, how can we find a ferromagnetic ground state in the Hubbard model we have this competition between on-site repulsion, which is pro uh, ferromagnetism and kinetic energy, which is contra. And they gave rigorous results on emergence of ferromagnetism if you have a flat band in the system. The famous example is the Hubbard on Kagome. They found a unique ferromagnetic ground state for one particular electron filling that corresponds to half field flat band. And that is a rigorous result. At that time, their results didn't get so much attention because mathematical papers, not easy to understand. And meanwhile, they are classical and seminal papers getting more citations right now than in the first decade, decade in the 90s. Our approach to this problem was some kind of reinvention of flat band scenario in spin systems. We were not aware of these papers by Tasaki and Mielke at that time. And we were not searching for flat bands, but our interest was in magnetization curves. In this time, at that time, there was a focus on how we can get magnetization plateaus in spin systems. And it appeared that frustrated systems often show a plateau in the magnetization curve. If you consider the square lattice, unfrustrated, you have more or less, not a perfect straight line. Classic, on the classical level, you would have a straight line, but a simple curvature, 
Note that the steps here are finalized ice effects because most of the results are obtained by exact degradation on finite lattices. In the triangular lattice, you have this well uh, pronounced plateau that was known at that time. And then we started to investigate the cargo May system. First looking for plateau, and then we realized that there's a jump to saturation. And this jump, interestingly, is size independent. Same height of the jump for all the system sizes given here. And moreover, looking for the numerical data, we realized that the energies relevant along this line are simple numbers like six, nine, 12, and only based on this numerical results, we started to think about the reason for that. And indeed, that is related, well known meanwhile, on the lowest flat band, cargo may, antiferromagnet. These are the excitations, one magnet excitations above the ferromagnetic ground state. Ferromagnetic ground state you have if you apply a very strong magnetic field. And then you consider excitations above the state and you get a flat band and having a flat band that is well known middle while you, meanwhile you can construct localized states and the most compact ones are those where a spin flip is located on a hexagon. This picture is meanwhile well known and very often shown in the literature. Okay, it is a true quantum effect because the height of the jump scales with one over S and disappears in the classical limit. Okay, that is one particle physics. Let's go to the many body physics because these localized states are limited on a finite small area of the lattice. You can fill the lattice with more localized magnon states. And uh, as long as they are separated, they are independent of each other and you can fill the lattice uh, by considering this distance between uh, the localized magnon state It's not allowed to have neighboring occupied cells. That means we have some kind of a hardcore rule. And then you can think about maximum filling that is some kind of magnon crystal. And the magnon fill, uh, maximum filling, sorry, maximum filling uh, is just this part here before the jump, the plateau states is a magnon crystalline state with maximum filling. That means we have a sequence of exact multi-particle eigenstates, which are lowest in the corresponding sectors of total magnetization. That means they contribute to ground state physics. And you can imagine that you have many possibilities to, to locate these uh, three magnons on the lattice, and that yields an uh, enormous degeneracy of all the localized magnon ground state at the saturation field. That means here, precisely here, we have a huge number of many body quantum states, localized ones, which are degenerate. And we have an example where in a uh, interacting many body quantum system, we have a residual entropy. Okay, of course, not only the cargo may lattice is uh, an example of this flat band and multi magnon states. There are many examples. Meanwhile, one dimensional systems are well studied. We have two dimensional systems, star letters, checkerboard and so on. We have three dimensional lattices. Our approach uh, to consider lattice was a little bit different, was a little bit different from what you are doing in uh, your group in Dijon. You are more or less uh, looking for flatbed generators. We were looking for systems which are discussed within a different context, maybe in relation to materials. And all these, uh, these uh, lattices shown here or discussed also uh, in relation in, 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 uh, in, in uh, situations where no flat band physics is discussed. That means they were known before we started flat band physics of these systems. Okay, further development, this mapping, this, this localized nature of the uh, localized many body states allows a geometrical interpretation. That means we can map the flat band degrees of freedom on classical hardcore models, for instance, cargo may. These compact localized states can be described by hard hexagons or the triangular lattice. And that allows to give analytical formulas for thermodynamic quantities, specific heat, entropy, the low T regime, 
Uh, that means we have a many body system when can, we can give analytical formulas for basic thermodynamic quantities. Okay, later on, we realized the relation between Milke Tasaki and our spin physics, both of course flat bands and localized states. And I will speak a little bit about this problem because it seems to me interesting because we have a relation between flat band ferromagnetism and a percolation problem. And in the last decade, we have an enormous increase of activities on flat bands. And I will speak about a recent result on magnon crystallization in Kagame. Of course, in your group, there are very important contributions. Uh, here's a review and uh, yeah, a lot of interesting contributions coming from Korea. Okay, flat band ferromagnetism as a Pauli correlated percolation problem. Okay, ferromagnetism in the Hubbard model, general aspect. The old problem is how we can get ferromagnetism in electronic systems going beyond the mean field description. And the idea was, okay, Hubbard model could be an appropriate model. The so simple idea is we have this on-site repulsion plus Pauli principle. That means to avoid you, it is good to have parallel spin orientation, favors up-up configurations. That was the reason to introduce the Hubbard model. But the simple idea doesn't work because it seemed, it, it appeared that the kinetic energy uh, is more active than the U. That means it is underestimated and the ferromagnetic ground state in the Hubbard model is not typical, is a rare example. The way out seems to be simple, but it took time to get it. Suppression of kinetic energy. And that is not what they, what they uh, found uh, in the early 90s, Mil Kitasaki flat band ferromagnetism. And what they found is exact statement for a singular value of electron number. That means the ferromagnetic full operized state is an exact ground state, but only for one particular electron number. The unresolved problem is, does the ferromagnetism exist in a finite region of electron concentration? If you have only one number in electrons, concentration, it might happen that uh, it doesn't play a role in experimental observations. Okay, that was, that was uh, our main target in the early paper of 2012. We consider two examples, which is a one dimensional model and a two dimensional model, a model which was is artificial somehow introduced by Tasaki. And what we know is that the localized electron states are states where the electron is located on a valley. This valley here for one dimensional and this kind of valley here for the two dimensional system. These are exact localized one electron eigenstates. The electron is trapped in a valley. Okay. And this gives you a simple geometrical picture for ground state ferromagnetism. Saturated ferromagnetism is given for one particular electron density if all the trapping cells are filled with up electrons. All trapping cells, all valleys are filled. And if they are filled with up electrons, how about U is not effective and you can only enlarge the energy. That means these are really low, uh, this is, these are really low lying states, ground states, because U doesn't play a role. Okay. That is one particular filling. What happens if the filling is lower? Then you can have clusters of occupied valleys, for instance, with up, up. But then you can separate the cluster. You can occupy either with up or down. That means you have a mixture of separated clusters with up and down. And you can imagine that is a fa that favors paramagnetism, yeah? because you have a mixture of up and down. And indeed, if you consider this in more detail for the sort of chain, one dimensional, that is the fully polarized state, all cells are occupied. And this uh, mapping of the localized state on classical degrees of freedom allows uh, investigation of system sizes of up to 512 sites. And what you can see is by increasing the size, uh, this curve goes down and in the limit of n goes to infinity, Again, only one particular filling remains 
on the side of ferromagnetism. That means paramagnetism, and only here we have one ferromagnetic electron filling. Okay, that is not what we would like to have. And the next step is what happens in 2D. And again, we have the situation we have separated clusters. That is a connected cluster of three cells, one cell, and you can map it on a corresponding two dimensional square lattice. That is one side occupied. These are three sides occupied belonging to the three cells. And now we have fully polarized state. And of course we have an SU2 symmetry. That means uh, if I have fully polarized state, you can flip stepwise till all spins are down in the separated clusters. And that gives you a weight, the so-called Kramer uh, degeneracy of M plus one. M plus one is the number of sites on the square lattice. And that allows the percolation theory to apply in a different style. Namely, what we need to have ground state ferromagnetism, we need a macroscopic cluster of polarized spins, which dominates the properties of the system. Okay, that was what we did. And first we have to, to speak about the weight of the clusters. This is a cluster of four connected valleys occupied. And the weight is four M plus one, Kramer's degeneracy is five. And now we have also four occupied valleys, but all the valleys are separated from each other. That means only one electron in a valley. That means four clusters multiplied the Kramer's degeneracy gives 16 because MI is one, but we have four of these. That means the average, the pack, uh, sorry, the, the uh, weight of the separated cluster is much higher than the weight of the connected clusters. That means in principle, these weights lead to a favoring of separated clusters. That means a favoring of uh, paramagnetism. Okay. Nevertheless, we can construct a percolation theory. And these are some snapshots. That is the uh, percolation, uh, that, that is the prob uh, probability of uh, number of electrons or occupation of sites. And you see between 6.2 and 6.5 develops a large cluster. And then we have indeed for 70 and 78, we have a large, very large uh, cluster which is distributed over the whole lattice. And by the way, P equal to one would be the, uh, this, uh, the uh, concentration where all the values are occupied. That was, would be the exact uh, state uh, already known from Tasaki and uh, Mirka. That means what we see is a finite region of ground state ferromagnetism. Here it is seen, different sizes of the system. Three regimes, three regimes, paramagnetism, unsaturated ferromagnetism, and then saturated, saturated ferromagnetism for this concentration. Please note that the percolation for the standard percolation on a square lattice is 0.59. That means these numbers are larger. We need more higher concentration because of this weights powerly correlated Kramer weights poly correlated percolation, which shifts this uh, thresholds to higher values of P. Okay, that means our statement is, sorry, we can get indeed a finite region of ground state ferromagnetism in the Hubbard model. Let's go back to the spin system. That is now our main focus. And as I mentioned already, we do not want to investigate flat band spin systems, which we construct to have a flat band, but only flat band spin systems with some relation to magnetic compounds. To give two recent examples, there was found a series of magnum crystals appearing under high magnetic fields in the cargo main antiferromagnet by a group in Japan. And what is also quite recently magnetization process of a certain compound, a tetzelbite, which is a system of weakly coupled spin one half sort of chain. Very recent papers which motivated us to reconsider this problem for spin systems. And by this paper on Kagame, gave this paper on Kagame gave us a motivation to re re reinvestigate magnon crystallization in the Kagame Heisenberg antiferromagnetic. That is a paper which we published last year. Let's go back to the magnetization curve. 
only the upper part. That is the jump. Again, you see no dependence on the size of the system. That is a plateau. It is not very wide, but the plateau, plateau exists. And the plateau states at zero temperature in the ground state is at that value. And the state is a magnum crystal. That means these cells, compact cells, are filled with spin flips. And all the other sites uh, uh, contain spin up, spin ups. That means that gives a seven, seven over nine plateau. Okay, that is the exact ground state at zero temperature. The question is, experiments are performed, of course, at finite T. Sorry, is this magnum crystal seen at finite T? Is there even a phase transition at a finite temperature to a ordered, ordered state, ordered phase of magnum crystal nature? Okay, that is what we did in our paper. There's an anal early analytical description of flat band physics by mapping of the low lying quantum degrees of freedom on classical hard hexagon models. That goes back mainly to Zhitomirsky Tsunetsugo. We also did something, but that is the main paper. And what she found is by mapping of these degrees of freedom on hard hexagon problem, that there is indeed a finite temperature order disorder transition near the saturation field. And they predict even a critical temperature given by this formula. That means it depends on the separation on the saturation field. And they even give uh, the universality class is a two dimensional three state POTS model. And their investigations are based on Baxter's exact solution of the hard hexagon model on the triangular lattice. That means more or less the physics was known for this hard hexagon model. Unresolved problem, they consider only the compact localized states, no other localized states, no excitations. And we know that there are many, many low-lying non-hard hexagon states, which were ignored by Zhitomirsky and Tsunetsugo. We out to take them into account, all states, by large-scale numerics, and only now we were able to perform this uh, investigations because we have now a very efficient code using the so-called finite temperature lenses method. And because of development of uh, computer technology, we are now able to consider system sizes of up to 72 sites that allow some analyze, anal analysis of uh, finite size effects. Okay, let's consider these results. First, hard hexagon, Zhitomirsky, Tsunetsugo. Their results demonstrate the phase transition within this model. It is singularity in specific heat. But what they also see, if you consider the plateau width given by this numerical data, this plateau width, yeah, then we can clearly see that they get a peak outside the plateau, even significantly below the plateau. And that is difficult, that is definitively a wrong result. Uh, the temperature is high, particular high here for this uh, peak. And now we consider our model, the full model, and we compare here small system 36 and large system 63. And what we see is as follows. That is saturation. We have a peak above the saturation. They have it also here, no finite size effect. That is a peak which is not related to any phase transition. But slightly below the saturation, we have a well-pronounced peak, which is much higher for 63 than for 36. And if we consider this temperature, that means, sorry, this temperature, quite high temperature, we see this curve. And no indication of a sharp peak. And even the peak is outside the plateau. And one more point is, 36 is above 63. That means the full model gives a sharp peak, but not for this temperature. Sorry, for this temperature. Oh, sorry, that, that is, that is uh, wrong what I did here, 0.5. Uh, hard hexagon model is insufficient. Magnum crystal, sorry, 
Magnum crystal phase appears also at magnetic fields significantly below the plateau in the hot hexagon model, and the, the critical temperature is overestimated. What we did next is we take this peak, well pronounced, and analyze this peak independent on the system size. Different system sizes are given here between 27 and 72. And what we really see, the peak position is more or less not identical, but very close to each other. And the height of the peak increases with the system, system size. And that gives us to construct some kind of phase diagram, namely taking the peak position, T max, and showing this peak position versus the deviation from the saturation field, below the saturation field. That is a magnetic field, that is a plateau width, limit of the left side of the plateau for uh, 72 and 63, and that is the maximum of the height of the maximum of the specific heat. And you see the hot hexagon model seems to be working well, very close to the saturation field, but then the curve deviates and we have some, some dome-like critical temperature. You could notice here that uh, 63 is above 72. It would be better the other way around. But uh, of course, in the two-dimensional lattices, uh, we have some symmetry, uh, which could be different for 63 and 72. That means uh, we have analyzed the symmetry features of the lattices and it appeared that 63 better fits to the full symmetry of the, uh, of the infinite Kagame lattice. And that could be the reason why we have differences here. But notice, however, that all the other lattices, 54, 45, are well below 63 and 72. Okay, that means our conclusions are as follows. In the full model, we have emerging singularity within the seven over nine plateau in this region. Peak position could be interpreted as transition temperature. The hot hexagon model asymptotically is correct as B approaches saturation field. We cannot give any uh, statement about universality class, uh, but likely it, the hot hexagon description is a correct two-dimensional three-state plots model. Okay, let's go to the second part. These are my co-authors, Vadim Ohanian from Yerevan, Jörg Schulenburg from Magdeburg. He's the guy who is, uh, develops this uh, spin puck program to bring the exactization and finite temperature lancers to re really a higher level. And Jürgen Schnack, my friend and co-worker over many, many years. Okay, our focus now Again, flat band systems with relation to magnetic compounds. Again, some examples, recent experimental studies, Sotus chain and magnetic field, given here, cargo main magnetic field, I mentioned already, and another Sotus chain and magnetic field. Okay. Problem with flat band physics in the models we consider so far, we need fine tuning of exchange bonds. What does it mean? That is a cargo main lattice. Flat band physics takes place only if all bands are equal to each other. So that means we need a perfect Kagame lattice. Sotus chain. For the Sotus chain, you have a flat band only if these two different J values fulfill this relation. So that means in any case, we need fine tuning. And that is, of course, a problem if you would like to have flat band physics seen in experiment. Okay. A possible route to a flexible access to flat band physics, simultaneous application of an electric and magnetic fields. Okay. Vadim Ohanian was for several months at the Max Planck Institute and we started a collaboration and first we didn't expect that uh, this application of electric fields gives any flat band effects. We even thought, okay, that goes more far away from flat band physics, but I will demonstrate that it is possible to get flat band physics. Seminal paper is by Hoshu Katsuro, Nagoso, and Balatsky. Hoshu Katsuro, by the way, was also taking part in our flat band workshop in 2017. And that is their paper. 
I will not go to details. It is some uh, spin orbit coupling mechanism, not very simple, uh, but based on the spin orbit mechanism, they can find that the electric polarization between two magnetic uh, moments is given by this expression. That means polarization of a bond, I and J, that is the, uh, the, uh, the uh, is it the vector of the direction of the bond? These are the two spins, and we have a cross product here. And the cross product appears in magnetism, magne in magnetism via a jarzinski moria interaction. That is also a relativistic effect based on spin orbit coupling. And now we have a jarzinski moria by applying a magnetic field. That means finally we consider the Hamiltonian Heisenberg model, ordinary Seaman term, magnetic field, and this K and B term, electric field times polarization. Okay, that is our model. And we consider now the Sawtooth chain, which is a paradigmatic model of uh, frustrated magnetism and also flat band physics. And we have now, Sawtooth with K and B, we need the geometry. That means we have a typical angle here, theta, that uh, defines the geometry of the Sawtooth chain. Then we have J1 and J2, of course, and we have the direction of the electric field. We apply the electric field within the plane defined by the Sawtooth chain, and we apply the magnetic field perpendicular to this uh, plane in that direction. That means if we specify the Hamiltonian for the Sawtooth chain, we have these parameters of the Hamiltonian, J1, J2, of course, B field, E field, and the two angles. These are the J1, J2 terms as sketched here. Yeah? That is the one term for a Z-aligned magnetic field. And that is a coupling a la K and B. And this coupling is, of course, now uh, related to the uh, individual bonds, J1, J2. And because of different direction, we have even may have a different coupling along here and here can be. And of course here, that means in principle, we can have three different couplings. The angles, by the way, are not shown here, but they enter this term as Hamiltonian parameter. Okay, further specification of the K and B coupling. It looks like this. I have to give to some formulas now. These are microscopic parameters coming from the spin orbit coupling. And now we have these terms in the Hamiltonian. They are related to this cross product yeah, of two spins I and J. That means effectively the electric field acts as a jarzinski moria I mentioned that. And jarzinski moria is typically given by this term. That means we have three different D here, given here. D1, D2, D3, and they are given this way, entering now the angles. Okay. So, more formulas, sorry, but it uh, might be interesting for people which are looking for this electronic spectrum or magnetic spectrum and looking for possible flat bands. That is a one magnet spectrum. I have two sides in the uh, unit cells. That means we have two branches. The formula doesn't look like simple. In particular, we have here phases K1, K2, K3, related to the jarzinski moria terms. That means related to the electric field and to this function of the angles theta and phi. First glance is, and that is what the people expect, if you apply jarzinski moria the existence of a flat band is unlikely. Even if you had a flat band, jarzinski moria would uh, destroys the flat bands. But nevertheless, we, let's have a look. Let's have a look. Okay, we found three cases of flat bands. We couldn't analyze uh, the most general case that so we started to find some exceptional case and three known cases. Of course, three, three cases, with eight. there are two known cases for the system without electric field. That means the jarzinski moria terms are zero. That is the antiferromagnetic case. We have, as mentioned already, we have this 2J1, J2, this relation. And there's a ferromagnetic case. That means J1 is, oh, should be uh, negative here. That's wrong. J1 is uh, 
ferromagnetic J2 is antiferromagnetic, and we have this relation. That is an error here, sorry. That is known and well investigated, and it is fine tuning. You see, this relation, fine tuning is required. We found at least three flat band cases for finite electric fields, depending on the field angle. Case one, field angle is zero. Case two, field angle is identical to this geometrical angle of the of the sorter chain and case three, it, the field electric field is perpendicular to the Basel Basel line. I can show you again these things. Are, that means this is one possibility. Another one is phi is equal to theta and phi is going along the x axis. So the point is as follows: cases two and three still are some exotic cases. They need fine tuning of parameters. More promising case is case one. No fine tuning of parameters is necessary. So that means that is a way or that opens a window to have a flexible access to flat band physics by application of B and E simultaneously. So that means this case we will consider now in more detail. Uh, sorry, Johannes, can I ask you, uh, can you course. go back? To yeah. So, uh, what do you mean uh, precisely by fine tuning or no fine tuning, and which parameters do you have in mind? Now, yeah. Typically, you have uh, the magnetic field without without electric field. You have exchange couplings, okay, and B, yeah. And you need a particular uh, relation between J1 and J2 for the sort of chain for other lattices uh, with flat band magnetism. You need also a fine tuning. That means J1, J2, or the one J uh, of Kagome, you need only one J. All nearest neighbor bonds must be identical. Or J1, no. J2, sort of chain you must know, have no, this no, no. relation. No, no I, I don't think you need it, but okay. So what you mean by, by uh, uh, parameters is, or fine tuning is certain additional constraints on the hoppings. Hoppings or uh, here in our case, the exchange bonds. Right. But then, I mean, if you if you tune uh, fields, you also have to tune them to certain values or choose certain angles in order to. Yeah, but uh, that is easy. That is easy. That's the applied fields. Sure, uh, but still, that's also fine tuning. But what you say now is, suppose you choose this case one, so the angle phi is zero. Yeah. And then, uh, what do you want to say that for any value of the uh, of the electrical field, you have a flat band? Is that what you uh, are going yeah, to say? Let's let's go to the next slide. I will explain okay. it. Okay? okay. The point is as follows: When I speak about fine tuning, I have in my mind any experimental situation. You have a magnetic material, okay, and you have the theory of flat band physics in uh, frustrated magnetism. And then you will see that flat band physics needs some relation between J1, J2, or J1, J2, J3, or whatever you think. And then you have a material which doesn't fulfill this criteria. That's a problem. Yeah? You can hope that it is nearby. Then you can see some flat band effects in the thermodynamics. But it would be the rare exception to get a magnetic material which fits perfectly to the exchange parameters you need. That is my point. But if you have a given set of J1, J2, let's say, and then you can apply a magnetic and an electric field, and then experimentalists can vary this in direction and in strength. Yeah? That is, for my point, not the fine tuning in an experiment or an experimental material. That I well, haven't... yes, uh, yes, but but uh, you still assume that, for instance, J three, J four, and so on are all zero, which in principle are also not zero, maybe in an experiment. Maybe they are very small. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. again, it's <laughs> kind of like a fine tuning assumption, right? Yeah. Okay. The so point. Okay. A little bit later, I will see that if we are close enough to a flat band point, then you will see some flat band physics. Okay, in the experiment. That means if say J1, J2 are dominating parameters and you have a small J3 or whatever, or a coupling between the chains, then still you have a chance to see the flat band physics in experiments, not in perfect situation directly at the flat band point, but near the flat band point. And the reason is 
because at the flat band point, you have this huge degeneracy with res residual entropy that will have an influence if you are nearby the flat band point. I will discuss it later in, in, in some detail. Is it okay? Sure, let's, let's, let's okay. see this case one. I guess you will now discuss okay. this. Case one, relevant equations. Again, the equations, the one mark, one mark non dispersion is, wait a minute, yeah, okay. One mark non dispersion is, of course, now much simpler. And now we have a flat band condition. You have to tune E to this value, yeah? That means not for any electric field you have flat band. You need a particular value, a flat band value. But you have no requirement for J1, J2. J1 and J2 are flexible. That's the point. Yeah, that's the point. And then the one magnon dispersion reads okay, we have a dispersive band, we have a flat band, and corresponding saturation flat band field is this one. And my point is in a experimental situation, you have possibility to vary E and to vary B. Yeah, these are flexible parameters. Okay, you can drive the system to a flat band point, even if J1 and J2 are more or less arbitrary by an application of electric field. That is a point and seems to be is, uh, some kind of progress in this uh, field. Now I come to the, to the results. Okay. You remember the curves for Kagome. I didn't show so far curves for Sortus. And what we have for Sortus chain, that is the situation without electric field. That means we have J1 is equal to one and J2 is equal to two, this uh, fixed ratio, singular ratio to have flat band physics. Again, a jump, the jump is very high, a broad plateau that is a magnon crystal where all the valleys are occupied with spin flips. And you see, if you apply electric field, different appropriately, that means the flat band field for different values of J2, I have more or less the same picture. We have a plateau, we have a jump, and a deeper analysis of these features tells us as follows. The macroscopic jump is still present if I apply a magnetic electric field. We have a wide plateau here. And in all these cases, we have identical residual entropy. This is very, very large the residual entropy is of the size here. You can map the degrees of freedom of the occupied values to a hard dimer problem in one dimension. And therefore all the data are known as uh, analytical formulas. That means we have identical physics to the known case without electric field. All these cases are more or less identical concerning ground state and the generacy of the ground state. Okay. This is more or less known stuff. Jump, magnetization by varying magnetic field. Now we can expect because we have electric field and magnetic field that the jump is somehow transferred to jumps of the polarization. And that is what we do here. That means these are these reciprocal effects. I have polarization, electric polarization versus magnetic field. I have magnetization versus electric field, numerical results. And you see jump of a certain large height and the jump of the magnetization driven by E. That means we have intriguing reciprocal effects. Jump of electric polarization driven by magnetic field. Jump of magnetization M driven by electric field. Okay, so that means extraordinarily strong magnetoelectric effects. And I should mention that uh, this stuff of magnetoelectric effects and later on electrocaloric effects is a topic which is widely investigated over the last decade. Many papers, because they have a, they have a potential application maybe in, uh, in uh, sensor techniques and so on and so on, even a lot of papers in science and nature and so on, because the effects are really interesting and intriguing. Let's go to thermodynamics. That, was a to that is a topic I discussed a little bit already uh, when uh, Sergei asked this question on, on fine tuning. Thermodynamics, entropy and specific heat. What we do here. First, we have 
the perfect flat point. That is a red curve. We see the residual entropy. Yeah. Uh, and here again, and in the specific heat, we have a maximum here. That is a typical short peak related to J. And then it goes down here, this point, this red small part goes down to zero here again. And now we go a little bit away from the flat band point. That means above the flat band point here, E is varied and here is uh, magnetic field is varied. And what we have now, the former ground state manifold, huge degenerate ground state manifold becomes now a manifold of low lying excitations defining a new low-lying energy scale. And what we see here, we have a plateau at low temperatures, and then it goes down. Here also, this plateau is just at that value where we have a residual entropy at the flat band point, and in the specific heat, we have an extra low temperature maximum signaling the low energy scale, which is in addition due to the form of flat band ground states. And that is what I mentioned. You can see flat band effects at low temperatures, even if you are a little bit away from, uh, from the ideal flat band uh, scenario. Yeah? And that gives the chance to find this in the experiment, even if you have, in addition to J1, J2, a little bit of J3 or J4. Yeah? If that they, these additional uh, bonds are small, you have a good chance to see flat band physics. Okay. Okay, I discussed this point already. And thermodynamics, if I have a residual entropy, then it is known that you have an extraordinarily strong magnetocaloric effect. These are old calculations, which are known very well, similar calculations for magnetic systems with a flat band. If you're traversing the saturation field, you can go down in the temperature versus magnetic field to zero. That means if you could establish this kind of uh, mechanism in experiment, you could have a very efficient cooling. Okay. On the other hand, saturation field is often very large and that is hard to get access. It might be better to uh, have an electrocaloric effect by changing E and traversing the flat band electric field. And indeed, we have some very similar curves. We can get very efficient diminishing of temperature by varying electric field. That means, and moreover, you see these system sizes are not very large, uh, only till 28, very small finite size effects. That means we can expect that this uh, behavior is still present for much larger systems. Okay, so last figure concerning this problem. Now I have pro uh, prepared some well, nice colored figures <laughs> that is more or less the same as that, but for different parameter situations, that means the J2 is different here. And you see in any case, we have similar, very similar effects, electrocaloric effect. You can go down to zero temperature by variation of E. And the point is that varying J2, you can get different values of the flat band field. You see the E, the point where you have the flat band field uh, could be different from here to here. That means, uh, yeah, okay. So summary, time is more or less uh, over. The point is similar simultaneous application of electric and magnetic fields can dissolve the fine tuning of interactions. Fine tuning of interaction, I mean really the exchange points. Okay. From the experimental side, we can, uh, we can get a more flexible access to flat band physics because B and E are parameters you can modify or can vary in experiments. We can get interesting reciprocal effects, namely jumps of the magnetization driven by electric field, jump of electric polarization driven by magnetic field. That gives you a very strong magnetic or caloric effect with jumps even. Could be have some relevance, you know, as purely theoretical talk, but it's nice to have some, to say something about possible relevance for application for electric control in areas such energy transformation sensors, magnetic storage. Don't ask me how it could be realized. I do not know that, 
But in, in principle, it opens a window maybe in future and so on and so on. And of course, enhanced magnetic caloric as well as an enhanced electrocaloric effects. It could have some possible advance for future solid state refrigeration technologies. And let me say again, the realization of flat band effects in, in magnetic compounds that means in solid state realizations of uh, flat band physics is useful because you can apply the, the really a rich toolbox of experimental physics in solid state uh, physics to measure this. And this point is really relevant to have it in really material realizations. Uh, it could be very useful for applications for different uh, experimental tools and so on and so on. Okay, let me give you some examples very fast where uh, this flat band fix could be, a, uh, could be a peer. That is a magnetic molecule. We did something about that. We see indeed the interesting point that is the flat band point. Uh, we are here in this material, but we see flat band effects uh, in the experiment. Okay, then really, a real, uh, very new paper on this acetatomide together with uh, Heinz, with uh, Jose Valenti, by the way. And you have a plateau like structure car, uh, for the sawtooth sort of chain. Then we have another acerid, we have jump here and the plateau, and these bilayer uh, compounds. These are the most promising examples for realization of flat band effects in. And another example is that one I mentioned already, this is magnet crystallization in cargo systems. Thank you for your attention. And interesting point is many of these magnetic materials are minerals. These are all that are cargo minerals and they are really beauty. These minerals contain copper as a rule and their magnetic lattice is cargo like yeah, okay, this is pictures. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Richter, for your excellent talk. Let us thank our speaker. So now we have time for questions. Nana, please unmute yourself. Hi, hi, Professor uh, Richard. Yes, I I have a question. So could you please go to the uh, slide that which is the condition for flat bed? Yes. Uh, no, is it, no, you mean, before, before. The form, do you mean the formulas, yeah? Yeah, yeah, there's, uh, yeah, yeah, this, oh, no, no, no. Oh yeah, this one, this one. This oh, one, no, this yeah. one? Okay. Um, uh, no, 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 no. So the condition for the flat bed, there's a dispersive relation, I remember, if, if I remember. Maybe no, no, no. Okay. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, this one. So we have a system and then we get this, this dispersive relation for the system. I mean, we have the dispersive relation. And then from the relation, how, how can we go to this flat bed condition? Yeah, uh, you know, you have the scale dependent terms. Maybe I, I'm not sure whether I got the, 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 the question just, uh, but okay. Take this relation, insert this uh, value of E, then here's sinus theta, here's sinus theta. You can see that we get finally simply by putting this E value inside this, uh, this formula, you can get this to, to, to branches of the of the of the dispersive band and of the of the uh, magnet dispersion. Now we have this okay. still a k-dependent terms simply by putting e inside this is formula. I'm not sure whether I, I got this uh, your question. Did I get it? I, no, actually I was just confused about this. For for example, from this epsilon k, and then from this step, how to go, go to the flat bed condition? This e equal e f. This, yes, this condition. I'm confused about this condition. Now, yeah, only for this value of E, if E is given by this equation, this flat, one of these two bands becomes flat. Oh, I see. Huh? That okay. means 
What, what does it mean? This expression, the square root, becomes uh -huh. identical to this value. One yes. bar, that the minus becomes identical to that value. Oh, yes, 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 yes. And both terms cancel each other. That is a technical point. That's a technical point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. I have another question. So uh, uh, maybe the slides before, because the I mean we have flatbed and the zero flatbed and not zero fl flatbed. Yeah, this case. So I mean I'm just confused about this uh, case three in the non-zero flatbed. Yes. So why this when this phi equals pay over two, then we have uh, I mean so how did you get this uh, uh, pay over two? Yeah, that is uh, likely uh, you have much more experience than we have. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We have this very cumbersome expression. And mm -hmm. the main part is we have these phases here. Look. Yeah? Yes. And um, to get a flat band, that means to, 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 to uh, compensate this term here, we need a special mm -hmm. structure here. And that requires some relation between the K1, K2, K3. And it, for us, at least, it was not simple to find out this, uh, this uh, uh, conditions because we do not have a general approach to do that. But uh, we combined numerics and analytical considerations. That means uh, an analyzing this, uh, uh, this uh, equation and analyzing this K terms. We need some compensation of them in order to to avoid this k-dependent term here. Oh, I forgot here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, oh, okay, last question. So I that remember is, okay. maybe the- I cannot give you a simple strategy how to do that. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I, I remember there is a slide that you show us, showed us that there is uh, uh, the flatbed for SOTUS, right? For when g y equals two times g2, I think. Yeah, uh, that is the case where all the d's are zero, you know? That means without uh -huh. the electric field, all the D values are zero. That means all uh -huh. the K's are zero. That is yeah, a yeah. simple case. Yeah? Yeah. Because then the K's are okay. zero. Only mm -hmm. if E is the electric field is present, we have this phase shifts here. Yeah? I see. So there, there are two, uh, two beds in Soto's case, right? Two beds. I mean, because there are two sides per unit cell. You mean without electric field, we have two known cases of flat band physics. I mean, so mean, without anything, we, we don't do anything and just mm -hmm. original sotus. There are two beds, right? Two For cases. Sotus. Yeah, two cases. Yeah, so you, you said yeah, when yeah, G yeah, value equals two. Sorry? Yeah, so sorry. So when you said that when G value equals uh, two times G2, then you said the flat bed will, uh, will exist, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I'm yeah. just confused. So uh, two two beds will be, oh, yes. So for two, for original sotus, there are just one flat and uh, one dispersive. Then yeah, you mean, yeah, 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 I see, yeah. I see. Then all beds yeah, flat system yeah, again, yeah. right? Then you have the lowest band is flat and the yes. upper band is dispersive. You have always two bands because we have two sides per unit. So. Mm. Yeah. I see. So, uh, okay, so you also generate all this uh, flatbed. So how do you think uh, the relation between symmetry and the flatbed? Did you try something about this? I, I didn't get it, sorry. Oh, so, I mean, so you, you also get, you also generate uh, uh, all kind, many kinds of flatbed, right? No, do you just, okay. We know I a mean, lot so of in systems. Your work, in your work, you are generating a uh, flatbed. In different systems. We do not generate. Our approach is simply to have models. And uh -huh. uh, mean, you know, you have a very systematic approach in your group. Finding yes, that. yes. Our approach is a little bit was a little bit different. Namely, we, we have a ge geometrical uh, approach or geometrical picture. Namely, we know uh -huh. as follows: if you have a polygon, yeah, yes. maybe a, a hexagon, and uh -huh. with case along the hexagon, and this polygon has Attached the triangles attached, yeah. Triangles attached. Uh -huh. Look at cargo main. Wait a minute. Or here, you can say here. Okay. Uh, uh -huh. That is not a polygon. That is a string. Okay. That is a string, and that is a triangle attached to the string. Okay. And then we know uh, that we can have a localized state 
along the string if we have a certain relation between the two bonds here. That means mm -hmm. a geometrical uh, configuration could be a string, could be a polygon, and attached you have triangles. And looking at that only from the geometrical perspective, we all often know already there could be a flat bands. Only looking on the lattice. Uh -huh, I see. I see. Thanks you know, for the nice. Our is not as systematic as yet you are doing in your group. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. this is more or less intuitive. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Uh, okay, we have uh, further questions from Sergey. Please, Sergey, unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, uh, Johannes, can you explain again what uh, this uh, problem is that uh, these uh, three cases, phi equals zero and then uh, phi over two and so on, can you show again maybe the geometry of what you yeah, had in mind? Yeah, yeah. Maybe 24, I just missed that. Yeah, yeah. So what are we talking about? Right. Okay, one is along this line that is a so-called, I call it promising case because fine tuning is uh, dissolved. So wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. So you, you take the electric field in the direction, uh, so phi equals zero means along this chain. Yeah, uh, okay, let's first say, uh, we start always with the electric field within the plane defined by the sort of shape, yeah? Within yeah, the yeah. xy plane, okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so that I shall say at first again, or repeat. And that means phi equal to zero is along this line. Okay. And phi equals pi over two means uh, perpendicular. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, phi equals zero means that you actually don't have a band structure anymore. I don't understand how you can talk about a flat band. I don't so what am I getting wrong here? So, I mean, if phi is equal to zero, you you basically have some kind of generalized Vanier uh, stark uh, level structure. Because I so so when you let, let's see what's the Hamiltonian when when E is yeah, okay. Ah, 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 okay okay so you know uh, I, I didn't get your point I, I said no 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 I see let's look at please please explain the Hamiltonian again so what what okay. do we actually do that is a spin do? Hamiltonian okay that's it okay yeah okay. the J one J two that okay. is Simon term Simon term yeah standard huh? okay. okay okay and then you have this K and B term. That is electric field times polarization. Right. Polarization is this cross product. I will show more details right now. Okay. And okay. because we have different, uh, depends on, you, you maybe you remember, wait a minute. Uh, here, look, this yeah. term enters the polarization. Yeah. That's a unit vector along the bond. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you have three different P's here, here, and here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and now we have this, and this term looks like this in detail. Right, so if you were trans, uh, to transfer that uh, uh, the Hamiltonian, that, that the model into uh, a single particle tight binding Hamiltonian, how would that thing look like? Uh, Did you try that? No, they are, uh, finally, I, I do. I'm, I do not have the equations here. But let's let's go first again to this. The angle phi, of course, enters via x and y components. Clear? Yeah. The angle phi. This one. Yeah. Determines the direction of e, and trivially, it is of course then determines uh, the component x and y. I cannot tell you the details of the Hamiltonian. I have not aware, but finally, it is on the one particle level, because we have magnons on the one particle level, it should be more or less identical to electronic systems. Well, it's just a tight binding Hamiltonian. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. One, we can discuss. One particle level, it is, it we is can statistics. Discuss it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. But but I do not have uh, available this uh, this Hamiltonian. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Do we have any further questions from the audience? It 
seems not. So in this case, uh, let us thank our speaker again. Let me say again, uh, thank you to you to giving me the opportunity to have a talk. And uh, yeah, it, uh, I remember very well the, our common workshop in 2017. It was great. And yeah, Katsura was there, Jürgen Schnack was there, and uh, Andreas Honecker, and all people which are somehow related here. Not all, but most of them were there. It was a great event. Thank you again for that. And of course, for having the possibility to give a talk. Thank you. Um, 